Good evening. I probably won't stray too far from here, so I don't know if I need to be mic'd up. I guess, Brennan, let me know. If I do, you know. Just bring it up, I guess. <clears throat> so, yeah. I kind of like this, too. Got something to grip on, too, and uh, be slightly hidden still. So, so that's kind of nice. Um, before we get started, uh, just mention a, a few names. I'm just going to have uh, Tim Ailey lead us in a prayer, but I know, I know there's many, many things we could mention as far as uh, things in prayer, but I, I know in particular, if we would be mindful of uh, Jonna, of course, Jonna Stewart, all of, all of her family, the loss of, of her father. Um, keep, uh, of course, keep Ed, Ed Gershenson in your prayers and his health and the treatments and things going on for him. Um, there was a note that went out from Jay Kersey, one of his co-workers uh, had a fall from uh, trimming a tree, and I've gotten word that he's doing much better. So I uh, was actually out of the hospital, but as well, um, and I don't, don't have the name. Do you, do you remember the name? Uh, Andy. Andy? Andy, yeah. Okay. And uh, as well, if you could um, remember my mom, she just got word from my brother and sister-in-law, they're kind of... Uh, taking care of this at this point uh, she went into the hospital she has some kind of infection they're not sure exactly what's going on yet but she's been admitted to a hospital in Quincy Illinois so uh, I would certainly appreciate that I'm sure that uh, my my brothers and, and my parents would as well so um, Tim <clears throat> So uh, initially, I don't know if uh, any of you study ahead and, and see what, what the lesson was about. And initially it said Nehemiah and Job, and I will apologize because as I get into it, there is no way I was going to do both Nehemiah and Job, sorry but not sorry. I'm sure it's, it's great to, to study the, the Bible as you have opportunity, but I am not going to be talking about Job. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on Nehemiah. And as I get into Nehemiah, I can't talk about all of Nehemiah. I believe there was an entire quarter taught on Nehemiah. So as well, uh, we're going to focus specifically on the wall. That's, uh, the, and, and when we're doing that, there was, there's four chapters in particular. And with that said, uh, I think it needs to be kind of a survey. I do want to look at some specific verses. As you all have comments and you refer to other verses, I'm, I'm certainly open to that. I'm, I'm sure that would be helpful to, to all of us. But, but in particular, it would be Nehemiah 1. If you want to turn there, we'll go 1, 2, 4, and then 6. So that's, that's where that's the primary text we'll be from as we look at tonight. What I've done with this, what made sense to me as I was looking into this, was uh, breaking it up into five acts. So um, kind of like, like a play or a movie, kind of looked at it that way. The, there's, there's five different pieces that I want to look at when we're looking at the character. When we're talking about the character of Nehemiah, and there's a lot of other good things, and there are things um, that, that we won't look at that, that relate to his character, but I'm going to say the character relating to how he handled the building of the walls of Jerusalem. So that's, that's kind of the, the focus here to, to try to narrow it down and uh, hopefully get through this, but you know, however far we get, that, that, that would be great. Uh, again, appreciate comments if you have them, but you may have to get my attention, so you know, raise your hand, do what you need to do. Uh, otherwise, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll move, up, move ahead here. So I want to start in, I will start reading a bit of Nehemiah right at the beginning. So if you do want to follow along or if you just want to listen, that's great too. So, uh, 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, up in the 20th year, while I was in Susa in the capital, that Han and I, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity, and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there is the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken, and its gates are burned with fire. 
When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of our sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, and I, my father's house, have sinned. I want to stop. I want to stop right there uh, because I have a few things I want to say. So um, as, as we read some of this and get into it, I'm going to backtrack a bit here and talk about the, the, the background of, of where we are. Now that we've, we've looked at a little bit of, of the story, probably a lot of us are familiar with Nehemiah, but uh, even if it's a reminder or if it's something new to you, uh, we're looking at the approximate years 444, 445 B.C., we are looking at a time period, if, uh, for, for you who have kids in the classes from preschool up to grade six, we are, are uh, if you're looking at the 17 time periods, this would be uh, the part of the return from captivity. Your kids will be covering that this coming quarter. So they will be actually be looking at some of, some of these details in, in their class as well, at their level. Um, so, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. That's what's going on in this, this time frame. The Persians have defeated the Babylonians. This was about 539, so think of Nebuchadnezzar, um, Belshazzar. If you think of those rulers who were defeated, those were the Babylonians. They got defeated by the Persians who, who are in power at the time. This is the, this is the most powerful nation you know, in the world at, at, at this point. We are looking at a king whose name is Artaxerxes. He is uh, the current ruler of the world. Um, so, and, and definitely uh, the, the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. Nehemiah, as we look at him, we know he is a Jew. Uh, he is a captive Jew, and he is a cupbearer to the king. So, so those are some things to keep in mind. He doesn't say that right away. We get to that in a couple more verses here. So, so that's something to, to just kind of keep in mind here. So I'm going to stay here with my, with my first act. Uh, as we look at Nehemiah 1, which we read some of, so we have Nehemiah who gets, he gets the word, he gets word about what's going on in Jerusalem. Not like uh, things, the, the news doesn't travel as quickly as you would like, but uh, he does get word back from what's going on in Jerusalem. He finds out that the walls are broken down, the gates have been burned, the temple has been built. So we know that that's happened, that's happened a little bit before this. So that's been going on, but there's no protection. There's, there's nothing to prevent anything from surrounding nations, from enemies, whatever, to, to do things to Jerusalem. So, so that's a cause for great grief and alarm by, by Nehemiah. So, so when we're talking about character, so what's the character? So that's, that's part of what, what I want to look at when, when we're saying character, and for that I'm calling Nehemiah's actions. At first I had Nehemiah's reactions, but I don't think that's appropriate. I think uh, of all people, Nehemiah, it's an action. So uh, what he does when he finds this out, he mourns for days. And um, something that, that it made me think of when, when I think of uh, mourning for days and the kind of things that we do for each other, and we see this constantly and, and, uh, and very often, for I, I'm reminded of Romans 12, uh, 14 to 15. So, uh, you know, as, as I have here on the board, bless those who persecute you, bless those who do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. And uh, he definitely has that with, with the people here. He is relating to them in such a way. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about his position. I will get to that a little bit more here, here briefly. But uh, his heart is with his people. So even though he's, he's many miles, many miles away, he fasted. So we hear that, that he did that. And then uh, part of it as well, his, his prayer. The pray, prayed to God in heaven, and uh, we looked at a little bit of that. It continues on through through 11, so, uh, you know, cert, dirt, uh, certainly have a look at that if, if you'd like to. That goes all the way through through verse 11. But um, right after that, right at the end of verse 11 here is when we're actually introduced to the idea that, that he is he's a cupbearer. That, that is his, his job. Probably most of us don't understand what that is. Uh, is he is the one who drinks whatever it is so to make sure that the king doesn't get poisoned. So it's a very trusted position uh, for sure. He's in a great spot as it relates to a relationship the king's short of not drinking something poisonous. Um, so, 
So uh, it's, it's definitely a, a great position of honor, especially for somebody from a conquered nation. So if you think of that, and I think that that'll kind of come up and come into play, that I think is uh, very considerable to, to be mindful to be mindful of. I do also want to relate to the idea here of this prayer, and I stopped where I did because uh, I'm, I'm remembering, as it reminds us of, I should say remind me of, but now I'm going to hopefully make, you think of this, um, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Psalm 51, 1 through 4, if you all want to turn there, that would be great, just so I don't have to talk so much, you don't have to hear me so much, if somebody would like to read that, I would definitely appreciate it, you know, if uh, somebody wants to, to take care of that for me. Psalm 51, 1 through 4. Thank you. So, so you see here, I, I don't know that, that Nehemiah was looking to David for inspiration on what to say, but I could, I could see how that could be a possibility. But um, um, I just um, I see, see things here that, that make me think of uh, how, how, the, how at least how those two relate, how those relate to, to each other. So, so that's something that I wanted to note. Application. So in each, each one of these sections, I want to make, and, and it's definitely not limited to these, and, and feel free if uh, you would like to make some additional suggestions. But at least I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning a, a thing or two that would be an application that would relate to what we're looking at here. Most obviously, pray to God in all situations. Um, you know, you see that here immediately, what, what he does. And remember who you are. Uh, I'm reminded... Um, Nick, for, for you and Jake, are you both? Yes, you're both in here. So in the podcast, uh, a lot of times in the questions that they ask, and I think it's really interesting what they've asked all these uh, different um, older, wiser men, uh, one of the things that they will ask each of them is, you, what, your, your kid's walking out the door, son, daughter, uh, whatever it may be, you're not going to see him for a while, what is it you say? And it seemed like more often than not, if you all can let me know, remember who you are. There might, they might expound on that a bit. Uh, but I see that as such a big part of it here. He remembers, he, Nehemiah, remembers who he is. Imagine being, dare I say, in the lap of luxury. You are in the most powerful nation in the world. You are, have an audience with the king. Um, we'll find even more that his relationship with the king is quite good. That, um, yeah, maybe I don't really care that much. Maybe I don't, you know. But that isn't what you see with Nehemiah. You see the exact opposite of that. Uh, as we're going to see as well, he, he wants to be a part of this, and he, he cares deeply. I, I can't imagine when you're saying mourn for days, fasting, praying, um, how much more you could care uh, about your people versus the position that you're in. So uh, if anybody has, yeah. source up to. Either you, you know, you remain fans of that team when you move away or the team moves or you can sort of jump on the bandwagon of someone else and it's really easy to do that when your team stinks. Like, man, it's tough to be a Mizzou fan when you're Oh, wait. Yeah, there's a there's a, a good metaphor, and I can relate to both your Rams and Mizzou analogy uh, a little too closely. But um, yeah, I, I definitely understand that. Going for the let's see, do I want to go for the 0 and 12 team, or am I enjoying being with the the uh, Super Bowl winners uh, this year? So yeah, kind of kind of a similar.
man, you're David, taking a... who was the Lord's anointed, and of course Jesus, who was at God's right hand. And there's this idea that the people who are really committed to God aren't just content to say, well, I've got a good, and so that's enough for me. They feel for those who are in need and hurting, and that's even the Christian's responsibility is to, to take compassion on those who are in trouble and do what we can to help. You interestingly brought up uh, when, you, when you speak of uh, Nehemiah and Jesus that way, one of the things as well, uh, for, for next quarter for the, the younger kids is uh, we have books called Shadows of Christ. And one of them, uh, not so surprisingly, is Nehemiah. And uh, that's one of the things that we do is we're in the Old Testament and we spend a lot of time in the Old Testament with the kids. We say, this is how it relates to Jesus. That's something that we're always reinforcing. And Nehemiah is such a great example for that. So, so thank you. Um, I'm going to keep on moving here. We uh, Nehemiah 2, my act 2 here. Um, so I wanted to look at this um, briefly. So we find out here that he, um, well, interestingly, something, something as well I wanted to point out. I'm not super familiar with months as, as they are listed uh, by the Jewish calendar, but my understanding is when he first finds out about this, it's roughly October, November. When this is occurring and he is before the king, and, and now we see here in, in uh, chapter 2, right in verse 1, the king sees that he is sad, which is a horrible thing to do before a king, typically. Imagine you're the slave being sad in front of the king. What's going on? Are they going to, is there something that's going to be going on? Is my life being threatened by this unhappy man? You know, what, whatever, whatever it may be, uh, there, there's, this, this isn't good. But that's not, that's not what we see. That's not what we see here with the king and, and the relationship that Nehemiah had. And interestingly, this time frame of Nissan, my understanding is March to April. So we're looking at like roughly a four month difference in time from when he finds out about it to when he is sad before the king. I'm not going to, I don't want to uh, speculate too much on that sadness. Obviously it was sad. And obviously if, if you read here, he's frightened for his life. And I'll, I'll read these first, first two verses here just so we can get a feel for that. And it came about in the month of uh, Nissan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, the wine was bef uh, before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. So I, I kind of think like there's, there's something on his, his part, because just uh, in a good way, uh, uh, the, the character of Nehemiah, but uh, he, he, was, he was frightened. So even if he kind of had a plan here on what he was doing, he was still afraid. So that, that, that's definitely kind of, kind of a risk here of, uh, of doing this and, and making this appearance uh, before the king uh, to, to be sad in any sort of way. So he goes on to say that, you know, let the king live forever, you know, uh, words of respect. Why should my, verse 3, uh, why should my face not be sad when the city and the place of my father's tombs lie desolate and the gates have been consumed by fire? And the king, king, king of the world, you know, like a, a Titanic, he's, he's actually king of the world. Um, what do you want? If Nehemiah, before the king, what do you want? You know, there's something going on here. So I, I, I don't think I can emphasize enough what kind of relationship you have to have with, with the king of, of the world, of, of the known uh, civilized world at this time, to be able to have him say, let me know. How can I make you happy? How can I make you, my cupbearer, my servant, my slave, happy? Um, and uh, what, what do we see? One of the things he does here, um, if you all, if you had a chance to read ahead, you, you'll probably see right away. He immediately prays. That's the, the, things, the, the thing that he does. And what I, I really like about this is oftentimes when we pray, and, and we do, we want to uh, talk about all the different things that, that we're thankful for, or what, what's our request. We're honoring God as creator of all things. You know, all those things that we typically do, um, you know, kind of based on Christ's example. Uh, sometimes it's just, in my, my mind, my perception here, it is something brief, like, okay, I got to get this right. Whatever, whatever those words are, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what, what I see here. And um, so again, we have the situation. The situation is Nehemiah expresses his sadness to the king about what is happening in Jerusalem. Artaxerxes asks, uh, what, what is your request? What is Nehemiah's request? Um, so his actions, his character, if you will, um, approaches King Artaxerxes with respect. 
he points out that the king actually likes him. You know, he, he'll, he'll say, if it pleases you, uh, if, if this is pleasing to you, verse 5, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, well, you know you have, right? I mean, I think he, he knows this. Hopefully, you know, there's still some fear, but, but I, I think he's, he's making a good uh, uh, edu- educated risk. That is not the term I want here, but uh, it's, it's uh, got a good shot at, at success. So he, uh, he prays quickly. And they pleads to the king's sense of ancestry, honor to forefathers. Even if you weren't somebody who's religious, that's something that was of interest. You don't want your memory you know, of your kingdom, of your great name and your great honor trashed. And he kind of appeals to that here. He's like, look, you go back to, we were a great nation. We were all these great things. And look at it. It's just, it's trampled down the, the, the graves, the, the tombs of, of, of my fathers, the place they lie desolate. The gates have been consumed by fire. The, the, the insinuation there is, you know, in my, in my mind, grave robbers, who knows, whatever they're, they're trying to dig up and find. That's, that's all a part of it. So he's appealing to that. And, and I just see such great wisdom and how he approaches the king and what he has to say and, and how he handles it. Uh, I, in particular, am mindful of Esther. I am reminded very much of, of Esther. Um, uh, I just have one, one quick verse that, that I was looking at from, from there in Esther, but it was uh, Esther 2, 17 and 18. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave her a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. So again, we have a Jew, a captive Jew, finding great position of honor, I, I did a little research, and I am by no means any sort of scholar when it comes to the uh, uh, family history of and or or, or the, the lineage of the kings of of be a Babylonia or or the Medo Persian Empire. But the best I understand it, and mind you, this is hinging on Ahasuerus being the same person as Xerxes one. This would have been Artaxerxes, the current king. That would have been his dad. That potentially uh, would have been who was married to Esther. So if that that gives you a little a little bit of feeling, again, I'm not going to say with any sort of absolute certainty. But the 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 numbers fit. I have a chart here. I didn't I didn't put on the board, but I have a chart that kind of indicates that that is the case, or very well could be the case. At any rate, we know that we have influence. We have Jewish influence at the highest levels of government uh, on more than one occasion to to influence what what's going on and decisions that are being made to the point of saving the Jews in the region you know when it comes to Esther's time and uh, dare I say the same is the case for Nehemiah in his own way uh, is saving the Jews again as well so uh, I think that's that's just really interesting to to look at and then uh, Adam Adam um, alluded to to Joseph. That's another one that I think of. Uh, Moses as well is another one that I think of. So you think of these type of of uh, men and women who have these positions of honor to make influence, uh, no matter what their situation may be. And I think of that in any situation in our lives, like no matter where we are, what we're doing, whether we're in the schools, we can be that kind of influence, uh, no matter what it is, be it homeschool, private school, public school, there's all these different situations that you can be the kind of person that, for God, really, um, same thing with college, uh, no matter what kind of college, whatever you're, you're doing, uh, your work, uh, all those kind of situations, maybe different affiliations you have, all the way to the point of where you go shopping or, or uh, where you find yourself out in the community. Uh, we can definitely be, we can definitely be that light. And I just, I get such great encouragement by this and just at all of the, against all the odds, except for God, uh, putting the gods in your favor as a majority of one. That's, that's where we see the difference that we can make, whatever, whatever the situation may be. So um, I think I got to my application there. Yeah. But, but one other thing, too, with application, carefully plan your steps for success in the kingdom and then follow through. I see that. I hope you all see that with Nehemiah. There's, there's definite purpose. There's definite intent. And, uh, and while he may have been frightened and, um, you know, showed that sadness, he had some time to think about it. 
and then that's going to speak to to a couple things as well that that we're going to look at always think to pray because this is going to be like the the character quality anytime i look at anything with nehemiah that was one of the the highlights of of his character you know that's that's where he went first any any other comments keep moving That speaks to chapter three in particular. Um, I suspect he was well aware of the, the silversmiths and all the people that he had available. He had a guy. He had a whole bunch of guys uh, that, were, that were waiting to do the work. So um, while we're not going to speak a lot about chapter three, that's, that's one of the things that, that I noticed in particular. Um, to switch gears ever so slightly here, I don't know if this is the intermission or, or what we want to call this, but um, Nehemiah 2.10, I'm, call, I'm calling this uh, Let the Jealousy Begin. Every, every plot needs a conflict. Everything's are going kind of good here. We have, we have some tension. We have some things going on. But, but here's where we see you know, the, the, the actual true conflict, and we're introduced to some very unsavory men, uh, in particular two of them right away, uh, enemy one, enemy two, thing one, thing two, uh, Sanballat the Hornonite and Tobiah the Ammonite. They heard about what was going on. And uh, as I noted in a quote, which I find this just so wildly unappealing, it was displeasing that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. How dare him? He cares about his people. He wants to do something good for them. Um, We can talk endlessly as their names come up several times through Nehemiah. We'll talk about them a little bit more as well. But because they are uh, politically affiliated, they had a lot to lose. And it would seem that they had a lot that they'd gained in this time that, that Israel was in such, a, in such disarray as they had been taken into captivity for a number of years now. So that's, that's my, my personal take on, on what I see going on here. But that, that's kind of, that's where we're headed. That's going to be a factor in, in the, the, the rest of the way of building this temple and beyond, but, but at least for our purposes. So Nehemiah 2, uh, 11 through 20, as I see, is Act 3. Um, Starting in verse 11, so what he did here, and I'm, I'm going to just kind of explain some of this and, and feel free to, for, for the discussion, but what is happening here is he's uh, to, to, to kind of review a little bit of what, what happens. So the king grants him what he wants. He um, not only does that, he, he, he gives him what he wants, he additionally gives him soldiers, uh, horsemen, he... Uh, also, Nehemiah goes on to ask for, for things like timber. He wants to rebuild the gates. So he has all these things that, that he wants to do. And without question, um, we have the king saying, sure, sure, have at it. Yes. Yeah, please do. So, so that's, that's kind of what we have going on in this situation. And then what, what happens here as he, he comes into Jerusalem, it says that he was there three days, interesting amount of time. Um, and I rose in the night, and uh, verse 12, it says, And with a few men with me, I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem, for there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. Uh, and it goes on to say that the, all the, the inspections and the thing that they did by night there um, in Jerusalem. This uh, speaks to me, and I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, just, just for, for time's sake, say, uh, didn't tell anyone with his actions what God was putting into my mind to do. I really like that phrasing as well. That He's saying that even to the point of what was going into my head, God's in control. Of So we have strategy, we have wisdom, we have God, uh, him being a good steward of God's information, giving credit to God in the, the meantime as well. And then that other point here that we're going to look at, he rallies the troops and says, let us arise and build. So, so that's something too, as we're, we're looking here. 
Let's see, I have in my notes. It says in uh, verse 20, like there, there was kind of the, the, the battle, or not battle, but the discussion with Sanballat and Tobiah, but he said, so I answered them and said, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, will, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. So not only does he say that this is something that I'm going to do together with my people, he also says, you won't have a part of this. It's like, oh, whatever, you can come along. Well, we, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. This is, there's some definite uh, no, gives them the gift of no, that you're not going to be a part of it. And, and we do see that, that that will be the case. So we see that um, in particular here. Um, I also do want to point out that as he's um, speaking with, with his own people, and I'm, I'm reminded uh, of some of the things that, that Nick talked about in Philemon, and we were trying to determine, you know, what's the best way we, we approach. Um, we, we talk about how to influence people to do what we want them to do, and uh, some of the things in, in Philemon. If you want to, if I have somebody turn there, would you mind? To, to turn that, it's, you know, it's one chapter, basically, verses 8 and 9. I have somebody look at that. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the Eighth, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Okay, so there, there's kind of a there's sort of similar appeal to, to the people and uh, to, to uh, make sure that they're on board, to want to be a part of this we're going to build this is something that we're all going to be doing so that's that's something i see i see here as, as we look at these particular verses a couple of the points here i have in my application always give god the glory which he does uh wisely protect your information be a good steward uh you can get more flies with honey rather than vinegar i do want to point out that later on in in the book of Nehemiah, he does have to get a little tougher with them. That's not the verses we're going to look at in particular, but but there's some things that they're doing wrong, and it does get a, a little nastier, the, the things that he has to do. But at this point, that isn't something that he has to do. That's something that, that we see here. And and to my point here, I kind of alluded to the, the builders of the walls. We have chapter 3, where we have all the stuff going on with the, the builders of the walls. And while we wouldn't go into all, I don't want to go into all the specifics of it, we have men mentioned by name, we have women that are involved as well, we have relationships of, of people, the sons and fathers, we have various situations here, uh, and even to the point of what their occupation is. I, I, I kind of liked in, in verse 14, I said I wasn't going to go into this, but just, it says, he built it and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars, like to, the, to that level of uh, specificity that um, he, and, and Nehemiah goes about kind of describing what the men did. I don't really see so much what he was doing physically, you know, kind of speaks to, well, I don't know how to rebuild the walls. How are we going to do that? I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but but we do see here ways that it can be done because there's there's the people to do it, and when they've set their mind to do it, then that's that's uh, definitely what's going to happen. That's definitely going to happen here. Uh, let's see if I have anything else. Let's look at Act Four. So uh, Nehemiah Four. So we're going to go past all all the the building of the walls. Here's where we pick up again uh, the, the ridicule and um, the attempts to derail the efforts of Nehemiah. And it says, uh, when it came about when Sanballat, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, when it came about when Sanballat heard that we were built, rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. Uh, he spoke in the presence of his brothers, wealthy men of Samaria, and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they uh, revive the stones from the uh, dusty rubble, even the burned ones? By the way, I get really hung up on the burned stones. So I don't know if you all <laughs> struggle with them, like burned stones. But I, I don't know. I'd read some different things as to 
the type of stone it would be, at least a minimum they were cracking, the, the, the pressure of the heat and that kind of thing was causing them to, to break and crumble. So uh, if you all have any insights on that, let me know. But, but that's kind of my, my understanding there of, of what was going on with all that. But, but at any rate, we have uh, definite ridicule. Tobiah chimes in with his own brilliant ideas and jokes about if a fox jumps on it, he would break the stone wall down. Okay. Um, then we have an addition of Arabs, uh, where we get introduced later to another man named Geshem, kind of be, forms the three of them. But not only that, there's other enemies not, uh, who, who are unnamed other than what their nationality is, Ammonites, Ashdodites, they conspire to fight against Jerusalem. So that's part of what we see going on here in, uh, by the time we get to chapter 4. So the, the, you know, the attempts to demoralize the builders, like they're, they're all hard at work, they're all doing, it, it sounds like just they've got a great plan, they have so much going on. So, you know, these desperate attempts um, by, by the enemies to, to wreak havoc and cause problems, um, you know, it just, it just uh, seems kind of pitiful <laughs> to me, but I'm sure it wasn't if you were the ones doing the work and uh, possibly getting discouraged by it. But uh, see that, that uh, Nehemiah sticks to the plan. Um, as, as we look on in the, the, the additional verses ahead, we see that the discouragement was over, overcame. That's the kind of the title of this next section. If you see in starting in verse 9, and, and we see the different things that, that he did. Uh, he went to great extent to make sure that they were um, stationed in different parts of the wall. They had um, it would be swords, they had spears, they, they had uh, breastplates and uh, shields. So at verse 16, you can see that. From, from that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, and the breastplates. And the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. So um, we see that. One of my favorite, uh, definitely at least one of my favorites in the, the Old Testament verse that, that I particularly love, verse 17. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. So, I mean, this is pretty serious. Uh, I don't know how you physically do that. I've been, I've read a few things that indicated they had the weapon with them close by that they could grab it quickly. That would make sense depending on what the physical work was being done. Some of them very well could have had held it in their hands. So, but, but I kind of take that as a play on words to, to kind of uh, bring that more to, to light in a way that, that's understandable. But, but at any rate, that is something that, that I've always looked to and really admired Nehemiah's leadership and how he has set up the men and has set the people up on how they are going to handle any sort of physical threats to what they're doing for God. So I, I, I definitely see that here. And, and again, to, to go back a couple weeks, Hannah, which was uh, such, such a great example to, to me, and I think of how she was ridiculed in particular, and I just want to look at a couple of those verses. Uh, it's from 1 Samuel 1, 4 through 6, and then skipping on ahead from 1, 10 through 11. I'll read those. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And then uh, kind of as you go on, we see what, what, what's her solution. She's actually prayed, cried, thought about this. She, Hannah, greatly distressed in verse 10, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come upon his head. So we see a prayer, we see a plan, and God grants that. We know that as Samuel. So um, we see that, that um, her, her prayer was answered. So again, a, a praying, God-fearing individual, and, and uh, in this case, uh, another Jew, we, we see the results of what that is, of, of a true uh, devoted heart to, to God and what can be accomplished with that. So, so I, see, I see, you know, real direct comparison here. Obvious application, can't say it enough. Pray to God. <laughs> While you work, hold God's sword in your hand. I 
you know, is that literal? Probably not, but I, I'm hoping to understand that as, as a concept to whatever your situation you're in. Uh, definitely be mindful of uh, what you need to be and what God wants you to be. Always be on watch for the enemy. We should never be surprised when he tries to strike. So, any thoughts? Yeah, excellent point. I I love strategy. I love games of strategy. So I love how he thinks. I I, I love that that idea. There's there's just all along this and all through this, there's a plan. And Nehemiah, I believe, would be the first to say it's not my plan. It was God's plan. So, did I see another hand? I thought I did. Um, I want to go on. See if I can make it through here. Oops. Act five. Nehemiah's enemies plan to meet with him and kill him. If all else fails, kill the guy. That's, that's kind of where we are at this point, uh, Nehemiah 6. We're, uh, we're going to skip past um, some of this and, and just move ahead. I know there's more, more points I'd like to make, but I'm, I'm getting near the end here. Nehemiah uh, and his actions here, we see this plot. And uh, just briefly to go over this at the beginning of chapter 6, we see Sanballat. Tobiah, and here we have Geshem the Arab, so we see the, the three enemies by name, at least what they're trying to do, hey, why don't you come meet us, we're, you know, let's, because they see there's no breach as it is left, they're still doing some work on the gates, they still have some things to do, but they're, they're seeing their, their chances of doing anything here kind of uh, closing in, in a very metaphorical sense, uh, compared to the, the physical sense of, of the walls, and um, four times, they're like pestering him through, through the, um, they're their messengers. Hey, let's meet. I don't know what words could have possibly have been said to, like, some sort of bribe. I mean, I have no idea what would have been the interest to to want to meet. Although I do speculate, at least in his actions, on one of the things that's possible. He has the, the awareness of, of the situation that this isn't good. There's there's no good to come of this. I imagine they could have appealed to his sense of pride. He could have got to gloat. I imagine getting to gloat in front of somebody. I mean, don't we do that any times? And if we were talking about a sports analogy, my team upsets the number one team in the country. I'm, it's everything I can to not be all over the place about it uh, with excitement. But that's, that's not something you see here. He doesn't show off. He doesn't act like he's invincible. He sticks with the work. He, he uh, has a mind to do what, what needs to be done. So, so we see that here. Uh, I'm reminded of, of John 8:44. You all probably know that by heart, um, but I'll read all of that. You are the, uh, the father of the devil. You want to do the desires of the father, of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, as do, does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and a father of lies. So that sounds like what we're doing. This kind of sounds like uh, what the enemies here are, uh, what are, are doing and what they're going by. So, so again, uh, be aware of your surroundings. The devil doesn't want to just meet for coffee. I mean, that's, you know, your friends might want to, but not them. So uh, don't show off or think you've got it all figured out. Be humble. Call sin what it is. And then finally... Uh, if we looked at Nehemiah 5, uh, 6, 15, so the wall was completed on the 25th month of, of Elul in 52 days. You know, we had this done in 52 days. So uh, the great success, the great planning. And uh, here's, here's just a quote that, that, that I love. Nehemiah 6, 16, when all our enemies heard it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. That lost their confidence, I, I think of, if I go in with sports, hey, you started it, Nick. If we go with the, if we go with the idea of the sports, when you see the, the, the tide turn from one team to the other, that's what I see here. We see, um, and I am, can't find the word that I am looking for, somebody help me out. Momentum, Momentum that is it. Mizzou has a t-shirt with that. Momentum, that, uh, you see that shift, and they are not getting it back. 
So, uh, character of Nehemiah. Thank you for your comments, and uh, much appreciated.